Uh, okay, this is a CLA webinar uh, on an important case that raises a number of constitutional and other issues, and you are all very welcome. Uh, I am Brian Spears, and I'm the president of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association, which has uh, the great honour of bringing this webinar to you all this afternoon. The Commonwealth Lawyers Association uh, represents practising lawyers in what is now 56 members of the Commonwealth following the recent Commonwealth head government meeting in Rwanda, uh, where Togo and the Gabon were introduced as new members, bringing the total to 56. The CLA hopes that it will have uh, representatives from all 56 countries and already is well on the way to achieving that goal. Uh, can I just mention to you that we have a Commonwealth Law Conference in Goa in India in March of next year and I hope very much to see all of you in person in Goa where we have an absolutely outstanding program of topics and speakers to share with you. Uh, today, the webinar is on savings clauses, the death penalty, and constitutional rights. I think another topic should be added to that list, which is a consideration of the separation of powers. And of course, all this involves a consideration of the Privy Council decision in the case of Chandler against the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago. The panel that we have assembled for you today uh, is a, a uniquely brilliant panel, I think I must say, and I, it will be my great pleasure to introduce them to you uh, very shortly. I have taken some of my vacation time to read the Privy Council judgment in Chandler, and I am sure that the panel will um, outline the facts and outcome of the decision in Chandler. Savings clauses um, are, in effect, those provisions which were the law before the, uh, the, the Constitution in Trinidad and Tobago of 1976. And the saving clauses, in effect, say that what was the legal position before the 76 Constitution uh, remained the position after the Constitution. And that means that a mandatory uh, death penalty uh, was and remains the law, notwithstanding that the death penalty is unacceptable in the jurisdiction of Trinidad and Tobago. The judges in the Privy Council uh, indicated that the 76 Constitution saves existing law, including a mandatory death penalty, and it saves it from constitutional challenge. The court concluded that the Constitution allocated to Parliament the task of updating the law. This important case raises questions about savings clauses, constitutional interpretation and rights, the Privy Council entitlement to review uh, constitutions, the separation of powers, and of course recognises the serious implication for Mr Chandler convicted of murdering a fellow inmate and facing the death penalty. It might also cause some to reflect on the role of the Privy Council itself as a court of final appeal in this uh, and regional jurisdictions. This case merits reflection and assessment and the Commonwealth Lawyers Association with assistance of Richard Clayton QC who will take over a moderating role from me, as well as being a speaker on the panel. The CLA have assembled a really impressive panel. Let me introduce them to you. Sir Dennis Byron, a great friend and supporter of the CLA, was president of the Caribbean Court of Justice from 2011 to 2018. He was a former Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Since 2000, he has been chair of the Commonwealth Judicial 
Education Institute, which convenes a Chief Justice's meeting in the wings of a Commonwealth Law Conference. I hope, Sir Dennis, that the same can be convened in Goa next March when we have our next Commonwealth Law Conference. With enthusiasm, intellect, zeal and vision, Sir Dennis has become a leading international jurist and has served as a judge of the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. All of us should read the biography by Dr. Francis Alexis entitled Sir Dennis Byron, Law Legend. It's a pleasure to have Sir Dennis with us today. It is equally a pleasure and an honor to have the Honorable Marlene Malahu Fort QC MP, known to many in the Commonwealth Lawyers Association for her stellar contributions to Commonwealth Law Conferences. In Nassau in 2021, she delivered a keynote address, took part in panel discussions and contributed from the floor. We hope that she can make a similar impactful contribution in Goa next March. Until recently, Marlene was Attorney General of Jamaica and was a highly regarded advocate and formidable but fair prosecutor. In January, she was appointed to a cabinet position in the government of Jamaica as Minister of Legal and Constitutional Affairs. Richard Clayton QC completes the panel. A senior counsel practicing from London, Richard undertakes many Supreme Court and Privy Council appeals in the areas of public, constitutional and commercial law. He worked throughout the Caribbean and in 2021 was involved in four Privy Council appeals. Richard facilitated a three part webinar series for the CLA on the Privy Council, which was well received and well attended. A Deputy High Court Judge in London since 2011, he was the UK's representative to the Venice Commission, the Council of Europe's advisory committee on constitutional law, and is the co-author of the leading text, The Law of Human Rights, often cited by the Supreme Court. Richard, over to you to get the webinar underway properly. Thank you very much, Brian. Well, on the 16th of May, 2022, a nine judge panel of the Privy Council gave the judgment in Chandler which is now very recently being reported in the weekly law reports, that case has very wide implications for constitutional interpretation. My role is to sketch out the issues the Privy Council considered. The broader implications of that decision will be analyzed by Sir Dennis and Marlene. In Chandler, the Privy Council upheld the mandatory death penalty in Trinidad following its earlier decision in Matthews um, and rejecting the Court of Caribbean Justice, or the Caribbean Court of Justice's approach in three recent decisions, Nerve, McEwen, and Bizram, a decision that was handed down shortly before Chandler itself. The key issue which the, all the courts have looked at is whether the mandatory death penalty, in this case in Trinidad, under section four of the Offenses Against the Person Act 1925, was immune from constitutional challenge as a safe law because of the general principle that legislation enacted before the constitution is immune from constitutional scrutiny. The Chandler decision is significant for at least five reasons. First, death sentence for murder is a controversial region, issue in the region and uh, importantly, the Privy Council decision in Pratt and Morgan in 1994, which decided that executions more than five months after sentence constituted inhuman or degrading punishment, was one of the impetuses for the establishment of the Caribbean Court of Justice. Secondly, the Privy Council has itself taken different positions on the savings clause. And in fact, Chandler, well, it's had many bites of the cherry, but the, in, in summary, the position is this. In a case called Rudow in, 19, in 2005, Lord 
Spain invalidated the mandatory death sentence. He said that the first issue that has to be considered is whether the provision in question, the death sentence, was capable of being modified under Section 5 of the Trinidad Constitution Act before it should be considered as an existing law under Section 6 of the Constitution. That view was subject to vigorous dissents from Lord Millet and Lord Rogers. In only months afterwards, the Privy Council met in Matthew, in fact, in a series of cases, but Matthew is the one um, which I'm going to deal with first, where a panel of seven judges deciding four, three, with one Jamaican judge, uh, Mr. Justice Zaka, making up the majority, reversed Rudal for essentially two reasons. Rudal's view uh, that that legislation creating the power to modify, the Privy Council now decided, was incompatible with the principle that the constitutional is supreme law. When constitutional rights must be interpreted as a living instrument and subject to changing attitudes and changes in society, other types of constitutional provision are concrete and specific and are unchanging, like a savings clause. In Rudell, the second uh, reason, or essentially the second reason given, is it was said by, by Lord Hoffman in particular that uh, the principle of um, using the power of modification before looking at whether it was saved law uh, was arbitrary to the point of absurdity, since it would immunize existing laws if, if and only if they could be modified. That uh, approach was discussed more extensively by um, Lord Hoffman in the Barbados death penalty case, Boyce, where he, he took these two examples. He said, imagine you have an offense of anyone convicted of burglary may be sentenced to whipping of not more than 10 lashes. That, he said, would, um, would be immune from constitutional scrutiny because the language was so simple and so categorical in its formulation that it was incapable of being modified. He said, contrast that position where the sentences uh, for burglary would include imprisonment and whipping, where he said that, well, you could modify and eliminate the whipping and leave the imprisonment. So according to Lord Hoffman, the approach um, which was favored in Rudell was arbitrary because it depended upon the precise language of the, the legislation, the save legislation in question, and in effect elevates form over substance. The Caribbean Court of Justice, however, fundamentally disagrees with the what's become the UK approach and believes you can use the power to modify the provision before considering whether a constitutionality constitutional immunity arises as a matter of existing law. In Nervais, which was a Barbados appeal against mandatory death sentences, uh, the, the court ruled, the general savings law clause is an unacceptable diminution of the freedom of newly independent peoples who fought for that freedom with unshakable faith in fundamental human rights. The idea that even where their, a provision is inconsistent with a fundamental right a court is prevented from declaring the truth of their inconsistency just because the laws form part of the inherited laws from the colonial regime must be condemned. Uh, in McEwen, which was a Guyanese case about cross-dressing, um, the, the president, uh, Saunders, uh, set out four broad and interlocking approaches which declared the cross-dressing law unconstitutional because he held and the court held that the provision could be modified. In Bizaram, the Caribbean Court of Justice reiterated its views in Nervais and McEwen and emphasized that in a democracy, courts must construe the constitution and the laws so as to promote fundamental rights and freedoms, where the constitution can be interpreted in two ways, one which furthers fundamental rights and one which infringes them, the court has a responsibility to adopt the uh, protection of constitutional rights. Uh, the fourth reason why the 
uh, Chandler case is interesting is that in general terms, uh, the Privy Council follows the principles of the Caribbean Court of Justice, at least in relation to constitutional rights. For example, on the recent case of Cipersad, the Privy Council held it was unconstitutional to detain children in adult prison, um, applying the Caribbean Court of Justice's approach to equal protection. Finally, and slightly intriguingly in a way, Chandler is interesting because it seems to focus on a current hot topic for Supreme Courts, the principle of stare decisis and the role of precedent. Contrast the view, which I shall discuss in a moment, um, that the Privy Council took about stare decisis with that adopted by the American Supreme Court decision in the recent case of Dobbs and Jackson, where it reversed the Roe and, Ward, uh, the Roe and Wade abortion case and, and indeed Planned Parenthood. So in that case, the American Supreme Court took a very robust view uh, about how you deal with stare decisis. In Chandler, the uh, Privy Council took a more cautious view. So what was Chandler's approach to stare decisis? Well, it decided that there was no basis for overruling Matthew and there were good reasons not to. It decided that the proper interpretation of the savings clause had much wider implications than mandatory death penalties. Uh, and that's obviously the case. And indeed, it's already applied um, the approach taken in Chandler to the death to, to uh, savings clauses in Suraj and the Attorney General, which was decided very recently in the 20th of June, which was the COVID about the constitutionality of COVID restrictions on freedom of assembly and on religious ga gatherings. Um, secondly, the Privy Council said it had consistently applied the approach in Matthew, and it seems that it, it has at least been uh, cited in, uh, well, considered in the judgments of 21 Privy Council appeals. And it was rejecting uh, the view that. Um, expressed by the Caribbean Court of Justice that Matthews was wrongly decided. Um, as Brian has also already highlighted, um, it also emphasized the Privy Council at the process of fixing sentencing penalties for those convicted of a particular offense is an inherently judicial function, sorry, forgive me, an inherently legislative function rather than a judicial function. So I would suggest that the Chandler decision raises many profound issues, but at least two uh, we will be uh, followed up by uh, my fellow speakers. Uh, one of them is whether in a constitutional democracy, uh, pre whether pre-independence or safe law should be given a higher constitutional status than fundamental rights. That is a, a, a view which Sir Dennis is going to address. And another issue, is whether save rights, so or save laws should be retained, even if they arguably breach fundamental rights, because it's up to the legislature rather than the courts to decide these issues, which are in some sense or another um, more democratic, the legislative approach rather than the court's approach. You, you can see that just indicating those issues indicate that this is a, a constitutional decision of very wide importance. Well, thank you very much. And can I now introduce Sue Dennis to uh, take up cudgels? Hello. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Richard. And I thank you, the CLA, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. And I thank Brian for his very kind words uh, of introduction. Uh, I know discussion is, is, is limited with time, and I, I uh, make remarks on the expectation that most of our participants would have some degree of familiarity with the cases under discussion. Um, in Chandler, the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council held that the constitutionality of the death penalty was not justiciable because all existing laws enacted in the colonial era, that is prior to uh, independence, were immune from constitutional challenge. 
I think that this reflects a traditional British constitutional principle of the sovereignty of parliament. And that when dealing with countries with a written constitution, where the supreme law is the constitution, there seems to be some difficulty to fully embrace this distinctive constitutional imperative. Now, the decision of the Privy Council in Chantler, viewed in the light of the more generous interpretation of existing law clauses by the Caribbean Court of Justice in the trinity of cases to which Richard has just referred, Nervez, McEwen, and Bisram, has somehow or other seems to have pit the jurisprudence of the Privy Council and the Caribbean Court of Justice against each other. And uh, it gives rise to the following question. Is the Caribbean Court of Justice a more credible champion for Caribbean fundamental rights and freedoms than the Privy Council? And I will uh, suggest an answer at the conclusion of my discussion. But first I'd just like to have a brief overview of the function of savings clauses in Commonwealth constitutions. I acknowledge that the need for savings clauses in written constitutions, or at least one reason for it, is to preserve the validity of existing laws, which were not validly created under the new constitution. And typically, the constitutions incorporated a provision, such as section 26 in the Barbados constitution, which stated that nothing contained in or done under the authority of any written law shall be held to be inconsistent with or in contravention of any provision of sections 12 to 23 to the extent that the law in question is an existing law. That's the savings clause, or as some people describe it, the existing laws clause. But all of these constitutions, as Westminster constitutions, were promulgated through an order in council, which typically adopted the approach, which was reflected in the Barbados constitution order in section four, which reads as follows. Subject to the provisions of this section, the operation of the existing laws after the commencement of this order shall not be affected by the revocation of the existing order, but the existing laws shall be construed with such modification, adaptation, qualifications, and exceptions as may be necessary to bring them into conformity with this order. Now, the gravamen of this discussion has to do with when and at what stage is this statutory mandate implemented? Um, and I am um, uh, following, of course, the current Court of Justice decisions, um, advocating that what this really means is that laws made under the former constitution or, or prior to the new constitution are not automatically invalidated by the new constitution, but they continue in force, having been construed so as to conform with the new constitution. And I should just make the point that the construction is not limited to modification because the very broad powers conveyed by the court include modification, adaptation, qualification, and exceptions. I suggest it's, constitution, it's conceptually difficult um, to conclude that there was an intention to immunize existing laws from the need to comply with the constitution. As such immunity would lead to what I consider to be an absurd result that until the existing laws were replaced, citizens would be denied entitlement to enjoy the fundamental rights, freedoms, and provisions provided for in the Constitution. 
Read in section 26 of the Constitution, together with section four of the Constitution Order, suggests that there's no need for an existing law to be formally invalidated. Because by virtue of section four of the order, all that is required is a declaration under the general law as to how the existing law should be construed to bring it into conformity with the constitution. I find it difficult to make sense of the notion that the Barbados independence order could have expressed a legislative intent to grant the constitution, which would provide no fundamental rights and freedoms protection in respect of existing laws. And I think the presumption against absurdity immediately springs to mind. Three of the former British territories having post-independence era adopted their own indigenous Republican constitutions and revoked independence orders in council. That's Trinidad in 1976, Guyana in 1980, and Barbados in 2021. Now, the almost uniform approach adopted to constitutional existing laws provisions is that the existing laws are validated or made constitutionally compliant by providing as in order four, as in the in section four of the order in councils, these have been reenacted in the independence, Act, the new constitution acts by providing that the formal laws shall be read and construed with such modifications, adaptations, qualifications, and exceptions as be necessary to bring them into conformity with the constitution. Now against that background, let us look at the three CCJ cases. In no ways, the CCJ considered the question of the death penalty, the mandatory death penalty under the Barbados Offenses Act and found, and I quote here, we are satisfied that the correct approach to interpreting the general savings clause is to give it a restrictive interpretation, which would give the individual full measure of the fundamental rights and freedoms enshrined in the constitution. Where there's a conflict between an existing law and the constitution, the constitution must prevail and the courts must apply the existing laws as mandated by the independence order with such modifications as may be necessary to bring them into conformity with the constitution. In our view, the court has a duty to construe such provisions with a view to harmonizing them where possible through interpretation. And I close the quotation. Now, as this discussion on the, on the savings clause, I, I, I merely note that the CJJ also ruled in that case in Barbados that the mandatory death penalty violated section 11 of the constitution of Barbados, which was not immunized by the savings clause provisions. Now it's interesting that at paragraph 69 in the Chandler decision, the Privy Council agreed with the CJJ on this point. And I quote, the ruling that section 11 has legal effect was sufficient on its own to determine the appeal. As a savings clause did not protect the existing law from challenge under section 11, the law could be modified under section four of independence order, unquote. Now turning quickly to McEwen, the CJJ um, again, I had to look at the issue of whether existing laws were immune from constitutional challenge. And it confirmed the previous decision in Nervous. In its analysis, it discussed the Privy Council decision in the Barbados case of Boys against Joseph and noted that it was decided by a majority, a narrow majority, five to four. And that the CCJ came down in Nervais quite firmly on the side of the 
minority, which included that outstanding jurist, Lord Bingham, by holding that the modification clause and the savings clause must be read together so that pre-independence laws are brought into conformity with the constitution. Now, the third case in the trilogy is this one. And it built on the two earlier council decisions. That case also an appeal from Vienna. The court held that section 72 of the Criminal Procedure Act was unconstitutional, applying its decision in McEwen. That, and I quote, the existing law shall continue in force as if they had been made in pursuance of the respective constitution and must be construed with such modifications adaptations, qualifications, and exceptions, as may be necessary to bring them into conformity with the constitution. And it is worthy to note that consistent with that reasoning, the disposition of the case included an order modifying section 72 of the Criminal Procedure Act. Now, coming quickly to Chandler, in that case, the Judicial Committee had to traverse essentially the same ground as the Criminal Court of Justice had to do in the trilogy of cases just referenced. The decision essentially turned on the fact that the board was, and I quote, not persuaded that it should depart from the ruling which it had made in Matthews. As the board has stated in that appeal and in voice the board convened a nine member panel to give a definitive, definitive ruling. And although the board was divided five to four on those appeals, the majority judgment provides that definitive ruling. And that's in paragraph 54 of the of Chandler. Now, I thought that that's probably as a result of that deciding point. The merits of the cons construction of the existing clause cases was dealt with only briefly. Um, and in paragraph 72, the board stated that if the, and I quote, if the correct interpretation since 1962 had been one of modify first, the savings clause would have been deprived of almost all utility. Now, I also reference specifically uh, paragraph 74 in Chandler, where it was stated, while the difference of opinion within the board, which the appeals in Matthew and Boyce confirm, and the jurisprudence of the current Court of Justice show that there were and are tenable arguments on both sides, the board is satisfied that it cannot be said that the majority in Matthew were wrong in the decision. Now, it must be noted that the board expressed the view that its and the CCJ's opinions were both. So I suggest that is a matter of concern, that it shows the opinion which deprive the citizen the right to enjoy the fundamental rights given in the constitution and rule that it was for the executive to mitigate and the legislature to take action through new legislation to remove or invalidate any violations of the constitution which it had admitted had occurred. With respect, I thought that the was a positive reasoning on the merits of the existing clause issue and a failure to engage in a discussion with regard to legislative purpose and the presumption against absurdity. Most strikingly, there was a failure to analyze the narrow way in which the constitution existing laws provision was drafted, which suggests, as the city of Jeffrey, that, it, that it is intended to supplement rather than undermine the corresponding provisions in the enacting legislation. 
This reflects a failure to appreciate how dramatic a change the establishment of the constitution of the supreme law introduces in the way in which it differs from the conventional position of parliamentary supremacy. I must end by pointing out respectfully that there seems to be elements of internal inconsistency within the judgment. For example, the board expressed the view that the mandatory death penalty was unconstitutional and that absent the savings clause, it would have so declared. But I ask, why would it be unconstitutional? And the answer is, according to the Privy Council decision, and as stated within Chancellor itself, that there's a wide range of conduct that could lead to a conviction of murder with differing degrees of culpability. And the mandatory sentence of death deprives the citizen of the opportunity of having the court In other words, it prevents the judiciary from imposing sentences that are proportionate. And this is how the a paragraph 79, Chancellor of the Board of position. It's an quote. What has been recognized as constitutionally unacceptable is that the legislature should prescribe the penalty that is to be imposed on any particular individual, unquote. But at paragraph 81, the board, I think contradictorily stated, and I quote, the difficulty which the argument of the appellant's counsel faces is that the fiction of a penalty to be applied to every person convicted of a particular offense is an inherently legislative power. The board is unanimous in Matthew in rejecting the argument that the mandatory death penalty was contrary to the separation of powers. Unquote. But when there is a mandatory sentence, the sentence imposed on each individual is in fact imposed by the legislature without opportunity for fixing the penalty to solve the particulars of the crime. If paragraph 79 is correctly stated, as I think it is, paragraph 81 would seem inconsistent with it as it introduces a conclusion which um, is quite inconsistent in my view. This position of the board is clarified, I thought, in its concluding paragraphs of 96 and 98. Now in paragraph 96, it's stated, that the existing laws are saved from constitutional challenge. And that the consequence is that the state, and I quote, has a statutory rule which mandates the imposition of a sentence, which will often be disproportionate and unjust. The sentence is recognized internationally as cruel and unusual punishment. The 1976 constitution leaves it to the president, having received ministerial advice to substitute a less severe form of punishment. And I close the quotation. Now, in my opinion, there could be no clearer way of saying that when the judiciary is compelled to impose a sentence that is cruel and unusual, it is the executive that must mitigate this unconstitutional behavior of the judiciary. This must violate the concept of separation of powers by giving the executive those sentence of powers. Now I, I quote from paragraph 98, and I quote, it is striking that there remains on the statute book a provision which is a cruel and unusual punishment because it mandates the death penalty without regard to the degree of culpability. Nonetheless, such a provision is not unconstitutional. The 1966 constitution has allocated to parliament the task of reforming and updating the law, including such laws. 
and I close quotation marks. It seems to me that this only needs to be stated for it to be realized that it violates the separation of powers. The Constitution Act, as had been previously discussed and dated, that the judiciary must construe the legislation to bring it into conformity with the Constitution. But in this power, the board clarifies that it does not recognize that there's such a judicial power. Instead, it contends that it is Parliament that has the power to reform constitutional laws when it sees fit to do so. In the meantime, and I think quite alarmingly, the citizen must be denied the constitutional rights not to be subject to cruel and, and unusual punishment. So I, I end where I started because I think this must be inconsistent with the concept that the constitution is the supreme law. And it is for the court to determine whether legislation is inconsistent with the constitution and grant appropriate relief. In the formulation of the Privy Council, just referenced, the court is impotent. And it is the executive or the legislature that grants relief for constitutional violations from existing laws. This violates the concept of separation of powers, but most significantly, I think, it reflects the failure to apply the principle of constitutional supremacy over parliamentary supremacy. So, to answer the question I posed, is the Caribbean Court of Justice a more critical champion of fundamental rights and freedoms in the Caribbean Council? And the answer I pose is yes. Thank you very much. Richard, you're muted. Thank you very much, Dennis, for, for um, a very interesting, and uh, which no doubt will be uh, followed by a different approach, um, which we're about to hear from Marlene. Thank you so much, Richard. Good Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are joining us in this webinar. I suspect that my invitation to participate um, in this very important discussion came as a result of the strong views I shared, unpopular as they were in the room in Nassau at CLC 2021 at the session on the death penalty, but which views are reflected by and large in the board's reasoning and decision in this Chandler number two. Among other things, I, I will repeat some of what I shared then um, about the concern uh, of the natural tension that exists among the branches of government, especially between the executive and the legislature on one hand and the judicature on the other and how that tension is featured in decisions on controversial subjects death penalty being one of those. Just to say that my approach um, is shaped by the perspectives from the lens I have worn and the experience that I have gained from working in different roles across the three branches of, of government. And no, the work that is entrusted to me requires me to keep an open mind in the search for meaningful solutions to real problems, faced by real people in various spheres in the society. I, I think we can all agree that a constitution is a unique legal document. I, I remember learning a long time ago that it enshrines a special kind of norm and that it stands atop of the normative pyramid. Difficult to amend, it is designed to direct human behavior for years to come. It shapes the appearance of the state and its aspirations throughout history. It determines the state's fundamental political view, 
It lays the foundation for its social values. It determines its commitments and orientations. It reflects the events of the past. It lays the foundation for the present and it determines how the future will work. It is philosophy, politics, society, and law all in one. And some would even say more than that. It is said that the performance of all these tasks by a constitution requires a balance of its subjective and objective elements because it is a constitution we are expounding. So said Chief Justice Marshall of the US Supreme Court way back in 1891. And then we have others say that the task of expounding a constitution is crucially different from that of construing a statute. A statute defines present rights and obligations. It is easily enacted and as easily repealed. A constitution, by contrast, is drafted with an eye to the future. Its function is to provide a continuing framework for the legitimate exercise of governmental power. And when joined by a bill or charter of rights for the unremitting protection of individual rights and freedoms. Once enacted, its provisions cannot easily be repealed or amended. It must therefore be capable of growth and development over time to meet new social, political, and historical realities, often unimagined by its framers. The judiciary is a guardian of the constitution and must, in interpreting its provisions, bear those considerations in mind. And so the question, how does the constitution's unique character affects its interpretation is one that arises. Put in other words, how does its distinctive nature affect the relationship between its subjective and objective elements? I think different judges and scholars of constitutional law naturally answer this question differently. Um, some respected constitutional scholars are of the view that when judges give expression to the fundamental values of the system, they give expression to the values that in their eyes seem proper and basic. Some subjectification of this process is inevitable. Complete objectivity is said to be unattainable. The personal aspect of a judge is always present and his life experience neither disappears nor can it disappear. Rejecting complete, complete objectivity does not however require us to embrace complete subjectivity. Um, we shouldn't move from one extreme to the next. I think it is enough for the judge to objectify his exercise of discretion. And alongside this, I will add that an essential condition for realizing the judicial role is public confidence in judges and the courts. This involves a deep appreciation that judges are not interested parties in the legal struggles, and they are not fighting for their own power, but to protect the constitution and democracy. Indeed, the court's authority is possessed neither of the purse nor the sword. Ultimately, it rests on sustained public confidence in its legal sanction. This fact must mean that the public recognizes the legitimacy of judicial decisions, even if it disagrees with their content. And just to be fair, the need to ensure public confidence does not mean the need to ensure popularity. Public confidence does not mean accountability in the way that the executive and the legislature are accountable and it doesn't mean pleasing the public. On the contrary, it means ruling in accordance with the law and the judge's conscience, whatever the attitude of the public may be. Public confidence is ensured by recognizing that the judge is doing justice within the framework of the law. I thought I'd preface my comments on, on the Chandler case and the wider implications of the case um, against that backdrop. 
Um, so it, it also causes an examination of the wider jurisprudence of the CCJ and the Judicial Committee of Her Majesty's Privy Council. Both courts serve as final courts for various jurisdictions within the Commonwealth Caribbean. And the approach taken by each is keenly scrutinized in a context where sentiments about nationhood, self-determination, and the real meaning of political independence run deeply. At the same time, rulings of the law lords beg questions about whether they are sufficiently in touch with the realities of the region, or whether they have sometimes imposed their own worldviews on us. And similarly, the justices of the CCJ, questions arise as to whether their as to whether the close proximity of their lived experience to the realities of the people, including their own personal experiences, put their impartiality and attendant objectivity at risk, making them too vested in the outcome of certain legal struggles. Those are questions that will, you know, always be asked, and um, we need not necessarily detain ourselves with them, but it leads me to the contentious matter at hand. Let me say that the death penalty is no longer a mandatory penalty in Jamaica, but it remains a penalty that is being pursued in spite of the fact that no one has been executed in Jamaica since the late 80s, around 89, 88 or 89. And our constitution was amended in the aftermath of Pratt and Morgan to deal with the delay in um, implementing the penalty. And we have also amended the general savings clause in very specific ways. Chandler number two is said to be welcomed by those who view it as reinstating what has been regarded as settled principles of law, constitutional law in particular, and for providing definitive answers on the constitutional constitutionality of the death penalty, um, particularly in Trinidad and in jurisdictions with similar savings clause. Now, let me just tell you what has stood out for me because of how I have to view the issues that emerge from the courts and the discussions that follow. So one, to say that a constitution is based on the principle of separation of powers is a pithy description of how the constitution works but different constitutions apply this principle in their own ways and a court can concern itself only with the actual constitution and not what it thinks might be an ideal one. Very powerful statement. In the light of our subscription to constitutional supremacy. And just to say that although for many jurisdictions our constitution came by way of, an, of, of a schedule to an order in council passed by the UK Parliament. It is still an act of Parliament. So the second point that stood out at me is the principle of separation of powers is not an overriding supra constitutional principle, but a description of how the powers under real constitution are divided. This issue of separation of powers is, is one that is often discussed, and it is discussed in a way to clearly mark out the boundary and independence of the judiciary and what ought be regarded as exclusive judicial functions, um, sometimes without sufficient consideration to where other functions may be shared. So the scope of the doctrine of separation of powers between the legislature and the judiciary depends on the arrangement within a particular constitution. And in Chandler, it was said that in Trinidad, legislation by parliament prescribing a fixed penalty to be imposed on all persons found guilty in a defined offense of a defined offense is a legislative function and not inconsistent with the separation of powers. This issue has, has been, um, a contentious one here in Jamaica, where the parliament um, is seeking to legislate fixed penalties and in particular mandatory minimum penalties. I think the statement coming out of the judgment, looking back on previous decisions, 
um, has brought some clarity on that issue. So fixed penalties, even mandatory minimum penalties are constitutional and can properly be provided for by the parliament. I appreciate the view of what um, protection of the law involves and um, the inclusion of the sentencing process in that. And I think this is one area where the discussions will continue and the debate will rage. So the other thing um, that I found interesting, um, although the board was divided five to four on appeals that have been referenced, the majority judgment provides a definitive ruling. It is often the view that where um, a decision is a majority decision, then you can look to the minority perspective um, for guidance. And while that is true, the fact that a court of final appeal has reached a decision by a bare majority may be a strong evidence that both sides of the argument are tenable, but that does not weaken the authority of the majority decision. Well known, but an important reinstatement. The law knows no better way of resolving them than by the considered majority of the ultimate tribunal. Um, quoting Lord Wilberforce um, from a long time ago. And then the other thing is that the board has a well-established approach that it is a task, is it, it is its task to interpret the words of a constitution and the judges are not to substitute for those words what they think the constitution should be. Looking back at what um, was said er, at, at an earlier stage, Lord Millet indicated that a constitution is an exercise in balancing the rights of individuals against the democratic rights of the majority. On the one hand, the fundamental rights and freedoms of the individual must be entrenched against future legislative action if they are to be properly protected. On the other hand, the powers of the legislature must not be unduly circumscribed if the democratic process is to be allowed its proper scope. The balance is drawn by the constitution. The judicial task is to interpret the constitution in order to determine where the balance is drawn, not to substitute the judge's views where it should be drawn. Um, and, and the, the citing of the previous judgment where it said the previous dicta, in this as in other areas of constitutional law, sonorous judicial statements of uncontroversial principle often conceal the real problem, which is the, to mark out the boundary between the powers of the judiciary, the legislature, and the executive in deciding how that principle is to be applied. Important reminder, adopting the approach that focuses on the wording of the constitution does not mean that judges will come to the same view as the meaning of a particular constitutional provision. The other matter, and, and I'm really just telling you what has jumped out at me and where I believe the discussion will rage, um, the living instrument doctrine enables broadly worded statements of fundamental rights to be adapted to reflect changing attitudes and changes in society, but not all provisions in a constitution are of that nature. The meaning and purpose of a savings clause which preserves existing law does not change over time. And I have to say that I heard Sir Dennis's view on the savings clause and working as a parliamentarian and in the executive, one of the things that um, struck me is that is the, the importance in, in looking at the importance of the savings clause is the stability which it brings in a jurisdiction. No, I, I fully appreciate the view that for us in the region where we inherited the, the laws of the colonizer, there are many matters that shouldn't be accepted or regarded as just for us as we move forward on the path of self-determination. 
but the process of passing laws is not an easy one. The parliamentary process is not a simple one. It requires time, it requires talent, it requires resources, and they are not often present in the way that others looking on from the outside things. Um, so, so the stability that comes from preserving laws until they are, are changed and the importance of modifying those laws in an appropriate way. And I note how the debate raged in the judgment um, between the modification clauses and the savings clauses, the order and, and um, how they should operate. And I note in particular Sir Dennis's view and the view of the CCJ. But I think that confidence in the branches of government is, is so critical that the issue of the savings clause ought not be taken lightly and has not been taken lightly. And that is why it becomes so important. But from a parliamentarian perspective, um, it really takes time to pass the laws and to pass good laws. There are various stages that are involved. Um, it's not easy as it appears that this law is no good, change it. Notwithstanding, the parliament does have a specific role in passing laws for peace, order, and good government. And it means assessing the laws on its book um, in a timely way and looking at their continued relevance. I will, how am I doing for time, Richard? My to wrap? Very well. Um, so the scope of the doctrine of the separation of powers between the legislature and the judiciary depends on the arrangement within a particular context, within a particular context. And then the principle of stare decisis or standing on what has been decided is a fundamental principle of the common law. Um, no dispute about that, it's just that the reinstatement of it makes sense. Respect must be given to the words and purpose of the statutory provision. And when a court of final appeal has given an authoritative interpretation of such a provision, it will normally be for parliament to change the law if that interpretation is thought to be incorrect. I will pause on um, that point before saying my last point. So the board's view that a distinction is to be drawn between the judicial exposition of the rules of the common law, which may be reformulated and developed by judges on the one hand and statutory law on the other. Pointing out that statutory law differs in that the statutory text is in some important sense not to be revised by the judges, not to be put in their own words. They cannot, should not treat the statute as a stab at formulating a concept. And on my closing point, uh, before we go into the question and answer, is just to say that I find um, the most interesting precedents to be the one that revisit existing precedents. And it is said that deciding whether a precedent should be overruled depends in part on whether the rule it imposes is workable. That is whether it can be understood and applied in a consistent and predictable manner. Um, the issue of the use of the death penalty has been a most controversial one. And as governments grapple with high crime rates and in particular heinous killings, multiple killings, the question remain as to whether the death penalty ought to be applied in spite of the views around it. I will pause on that point. You're muted, Richard, not hearing you. There we are. Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, we're now open for questions. If anyone would like to express some, um, it, it's, decided, it's, it's a slightly complicated set of principles, but I think at its root are some fairly clear um, differences of view about really who decides. I mean, in effect, I mean, one can analyze the legal position, but, it, but underneath all of it are questions of principle about who decides what, and in particular, in this context, whether pre-constitutional 
um, legislation or which has generally come from the UK should be preserved or, or, or not. So I, I hope, um, I mean, it does seem to me actually also that, that, that the decision in uh, Chandler has really put the argument beyond question for the purposes of the Privy Council, but um, that's a, again, something that we'll, we can debate. Are there any questions? Uh, if, if you would like to, I see, I think I've got one. Right, but let me read that out and then I'm gonna ask the other speakers to, um, to respond. How does the stability argument in favor of the savings clause hold up if most jurisdictions which have relatively long standing laws do not have savings clauses, especially considering that the Jamaican parliament significantly reduced the scope of general saving clauses in 2011 only to deal with certain controversial matters. Well, do you have a view on that either with Marlene or, or Dennis, but Marlene perhaps particularly? I think this stability question arises more broadly in relation to settle the precedent and overturning them and what considerations should be given when advice is based both at the personal and societal level on how the law is interpreted and understood. It is true that Jamaica did change its savings clause and now narrowly provides for savings for the death penalty and other matters which are rightly, rightly regarded as, as controversial. Those are set out um, in our chapter three charter. Um, so, so the question really has to be looked at in terms of what is actually provided with the guidance of the court. So for us in Jamaica, in addition to the death penalty, which is no longer a mandatory penalty, um, we have savings around sexual offenses, savings around obscene publications, and savings around um, offenses regarding the right of the unborn, which is on the abortion issue and then the status of marriage, really. So Jamaica's position is a, is a little different, but what has been saved are extremely controversial matters on which opinions are sharply divided. Uh, Dennis, would you like to contribute? Yes. Um, you see, I, 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 my answer is not, I'm going to address the Jamaica part of the question. Um, you see, I think it's important that the certainty of the law is obviously very important principle of what law is. But um, also, there's also equally important the fact that laws can change. And certainly, when um, a constitution is introduced, uh, it impliedly um, changes the law by giving um, citizens uh, fundamental rights, which they might not have had before. Now, the, I, I, I noted with, 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 with interest, and, uh, and I suppose not um, the Honorable Marlene's point about the court not um, attempting to be, uh, not attempting to use uh, the role of the legislature. But um, the, the process of modification does not necessarily involve that. And I'll just read for you uh, a small section from the judgment in Bisram in, the, in, in paragraph 86, part of the disposition where the court is now applying the principle of construing the section to bring it into conformity with the constitution. And this is how he put it, it, the court puts it. Until the National Assembly makes suitable provisions, section 72 is modified to exercise those provisions, permitting the DPP to direct the magistrate in, in lieu thereof, the DPP aggrieved by the discharge of an accused by a magistrate after the whole of the proceedings at the PA may apply ex parte to a judge of Supreme Court for an order that the discharged person is be arrested and committed. If the judges of the view that the material placed before the judge justifies such a course of action, 
So the, the, the thought I, I, was, I was conveying is that the, the power to modify does not um, imply a usurpation of the legislative function. And, um, and the way how it was worded in this room, there's a demonstration of a technique that the court could use to, to, to ensure that there's no perception that it was trying to be a kind of a deputy parliament. <laughs> <laughs> no disagreement with you on that, Sir Dennis. I, 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 my comments were not, in fact, intended to speak about the usurping, but there is a natural tension that exists um, mm -hmm. in a democracy. It's part of what it is. But um, the other thing I would say is that it is, it is a natural expectation that when your highest laws set the values of the society, that other matters that are not in conformity with that would be changed in a timely way. And where um, rights and liberties are guaranteed, that every effort would be, would be made to ensure that they can be enjoyed responsibly. And I always say that rights and responsibilities go hand in hand. Many people speak of their rights without appreciation that it is the responsible exercise of those rights that enable others to enjoy the very rights and freedoms that you want um, and hold so dearly to. Thank well, you. And uh, to that, you made a very interesting point earlier when you were uh, describing the, the um, constraints in Parliament um, to change laws which it wants to change. So even where Parliament recognizes a desire or has a desire to change, there are many difficulties it has to surmount. And that is uh, understood uh, because uh, it is quite easy for one to say that so much time has passed and why are there still laws uh, that are in that particular position? Uh, but, but I think that one has to look at the, 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 the whole picture uh, my, my view really is that, um, as, I, as I said, I, I, I can't conceive that, um, the, it was, that the idea was that when there's a new constitution, citizens should not benefit from the rights it grants. And, um, and, and it seemed to me that the way all these savings clauses uh, were put into the constitution with the, in conjunction with the order in council was to preserve the certainty of the law while at the same time providing a mechanism to ensure that citizens benefited from the constitutional rights which were granted. So that, that is how I, I would see this. And, uh, and I saw that as a, as, a, as a kind of protection for both angles of the question. Well, we've been asked um, other questions, although, um, well, one of them is this, although I'm not sure, I think it's actually difficult to answer this question in, the, this, in relation to this issue. The principle, uh, someone, um, or the former, your former registrar, it seems, Alton Rose asked this question. Um, the principle of legal certainty dictates that there must be very strong reasons before a board will depart from such a ruling. Is this correct? I just wonder whether, can I just make a couple of points about that? One of them, which is slightly odd, is having reread both Matthews and Boyce, is there's actually no engagement with the minority opinion and the majority opinion, which I think is really quite remarkable. Um, um, Lord Hoffman describes the effect for which um, Rudell decides as, as being arbitrary. And normally you would expect someone to say something different. I mean, there may be reasons for that to do with the Human Rights Act, which I won't bore people here with, but it's actually not that anomalous if you look at the way the Human Rights Act works in the UK. Um, but uh, maybe the answer is just what Sir Dennis was emphasizing earlier, is that both points of view are tenable. But do you think um, the Chandler decision will have any impact on the CCJ? 
No, no, I suppose that's addressed to me. Uh, fortunately, um, I can answer it because I'm no longer a judge. And um, <laughs> so my uh, interviews I have have no more power or value than, than an academic opinion. Um, I, I, I rather think that the CCJ will continue to hope that it would be influential on future Privy Council decisions. Um, there's, a, there's a level at which, um, speaking for myself, um, and, and, and I mentioned to you at, at our preliminary discussion, that there's also what might be a lighthearted light -hearted way of looking at the conflict between the majority and the minority decisions in the British Council. I'm seeing a conflict between Lord Bigham and Lord Hopwood. And as you have seen from the way in which the CCJ has dealt with the matter, uh, it clearly preferred the views of Lord Bingham. And, um, and we um, will, will, will sort of hope that um, it may get some uh, resuscitation sometime in the future. There is another matter, Richard, that I, I just wanted to mention as I read mm. the judgment and it speaks to the approach that is to be taken by the court when arguments are conceded and whether the concession of an argument necessarily means that the other side is right. And the, what, what the court needs to do in examining the arguments um, th that are before it, instead of merely making a ruling because the other side has conceded a submission. I, I just throw it out as a general point um, oh, a general to, to be noted. Yes. I mean, I have to say in the English courts, the fact that some people have made careers out of concessions below, which they withdraw on appeal. So um, <laughs> normally, normally uh, the fact that concessions made isn't determinative. But it, it, a, a court normally should express a view as to whether a concession is rightly made. And although obviously it's difficult to, to form a definitive view because if it's conceded, you don't hear the other side of the argument. But um, um, uh, this uh, does seem that this is uh, this particular issue of savings clauses is, I think, actually quite intractable in the sense that we now have, well, we've had a series of authoritative rulings which happen to be completely different one from, well, from once those from the Privy Council being different from the Caribbean Court of Justice, um, and I, I'm not I'm not sure where 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 it takes one. I mean, it may well be that the issue is considered again at some point in time, but one would have to imagine it would be considered in the context of a very different set of circumstances than a mandatory death penalty and probably some long way ahead too. So if, if I were to switch again and just to share some of the reflection that I've had to do having read this, um, it, it is no secret that recently the DPP here in Jamaica gave notice of her intention to ask for the death penalty in a horrible massacre, a quintuple murder, where a mother and her four children were slaughtered in, in just horrible ways. But it, 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 even proponents of the death penalty must pause and reflect on the finality of the penalty and the fact that it leaves no room for reversal, however proportionate it is. Um, what really, how do you step back from the very emotive discussion that is taking place um, and, and examine the issues a little more broadly. I know here in Jamaica, uh, ever so often you hear the cry for the resumption of hanging, probably one of the most inhumane way of suffering death <laughs> um, in, in certain circumstances. I think part of the challenge that we're facing is because of the high level of crime and violence, and in particular, violent crimes that just shock you. I recall the Privy Council stating that it is to be reserved, death penalty is to be reserved for the worst of the worst. And here in Jamaica, 
where we have an unusual murder problem and an unusually high murder rate, every time you think you have heard the worst of the worst, something comes that shocks you again. But the time it takes to success to bring prosecutions um, and trials to an end, including the appellate process, has to be of, of concern. And even the raw instinct of the people when um, murders are committed, you know, what do they call for? I can say that it's, it's really trying times for people like myself and others who um, are desperately trying to make the kind of decisions that will bring real progress to the problems being faced. But, but I do welcome in this decision, particularly on issues around the mandatory minimum penalties, the clarity that the, the judgment has brought. It doesn't take away the debate, of course, but it has brought some clarity on some of the issues. And there is one other question, which uh, we're not getting very many questions, but one question which sort of touches on the point I just made about possibly it might be it's important to look at this in, in a, in a, from a in relation to an issue other than mandatory death sentences. He says, the question from Alita Ramadine is, one argument put forward by some is that any changes to the savings clauses in Trinidad and Tobago will affect a number of laws, including taxation, etc. And it's, it's the view of the greater Caribbean for life that this is not a sufficient reason for holding on to the savings clauses in the Trinidad constitution. So I think, I think the point being made, and perhaps we could have a view both from Dennis and yourself, is whether the fact that something has wider implications is a good enough reason in itself to um, warrant a, the conclusion. I might go first, um, because I, I don't have a view on that. Um, you see, if the argument is being made, as, as was made, that one should hold on to the saving laws, saving clause, to prevent the constitutional provisions from governing the rights of citizens. To my way of thinking, that is a denial of the concept that the constitution is the supreme law. It is also, I suppose, a judgment that the principles enunciated in the constitution are not good for the society. Now, I, I cannot subscribe to either of those positions because if we have a constitution, one would expect that citizens of the constitution uh, are entitled to and are obligated to be governed by those principles and that laws which are inconsistent with the constitution existing laws which are inconsistent with the constitution have to be read in a manner that will bring them into conformity with the constitution. I mean, there's always a warning. I mean, Manning, uh, the Honorable Manning um, referenced it, and it's also mentioned in other case law, that there may be uh, stark differences um, within the legislation which does not permit modification. But except in those cases, um, I would think that there is no justification for not reading the existing laws in such a manner as to bring them into conformity. I think that's what the law requires. Marlene, do you have a view you want to express? Well, I'll, I'll answer it this way and, and more broadly, that for jurisdictions like Jamaica with constitutional reform yet again on the legislative amend, uh, agenda, it's a lot of work before us as, as our societies have, or peoples have grown very rights conscious and um, government is being looked at um, with great suspicion. Um, but important, but with important roles and, and functions. Um, hmm. 
just restate, restate the specific question, Richard, so I don't go too widely in my response. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, the question was really, um, is the fact that the savings clause issue covers so many potential fields of legislation, is that in itself a good reason um, for, uh, for, 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 for holding that the savings it. clause? Well, uh, well, I think that um, it is not going to be possible to change all of your laws at once. And uh, there are critical matters for the running of government to the functioning of the society that have been normalized through the laws and the interpretations over time and people's understanding of their own rights and responsibilities and where they are. And so I Again, because of the experience I'm gaining in these roles, I would say that um, Parliament must move very carefully um, in looking at the savings clause and also must take steps to realize for the people the goals that have been set in the protection of rights and freedoms, in the guarantee of rights and freedoms. I, I'm sorry there isn't an easy answer, but I am particularly conscious of um, what litigation and a multiplicity of litigation coming fast and furious does when there isn't the time, even with the best of will to respond to certain matters. Um, but, but my default is for laws that are fair, laws that enable our people to realize their potential and laws that can be easily enforced and applied. That's that's my view. And, and the yeah. fact that we inherit a law from the colonial masters doesn't necessarily mean that the law is bad, because laws can work well in a society regardless of their origins. But I think the tension comes from, among other things, questioning whether because of where it came from and because it came with the colonial experience and all of the unfortunate negativities that still continue to impact us, whether we should hold them. But, but institutions work and they work well. Um, you can modify them. And I think this is a point um, Dennis was making that really where, where parliament enables the judiciary to modify, then that modification can be done in a way that allows the goals to be realized. I think the tension is, do you modify first in order to save? And all that has played out in, in the judgment and the different streams of thought. I think there's what time for one last question, which actually touches on something Maureen was just talking about. But and Isaduki says, there seems to be a misconception that removing the protection of the savings clause would immediately make those colonial laws invalid. But this is, isn't remotely true, not so. The only ones that would be affected are those which are being challenged by people in the court for being inconsistent with the constitution. The majority of colonial laws would continue to be effective without any change. Uh, I would like to hear the panelists comment on this. Um, do you have a, a view on that, Dennis? Yes, uh, well, I, it is very interesting because I, I, although I hadn't seen this question, there was something that our learned and distinguished colleague Marion has said before, which had made me uh, think of a comment which I thought was addresses this question. You see, um, I don't look at it that the problem with existing laws is that their origin was colonial. Because when you look at the colonial laws, it's not the law as a whole that is often offensive but there might be a provision in the law which does not give effect to the new fundamental rights and freedoms set out in the constitution. So for example, in the Barbados case, it was one provision in the act which offended the right of people not to suffer in human and cruel punishment or to be, not to have the right for the protection of the law. And it was possible to preserve the law as a whole and modify that provision to bring it into conformity with the constitution. So I, I, I have seen, uh, and, and I, as I've tried to explain, uh, 
that the Seves law regime, if read with the power to modify, um, I think um, satisfies the interests of our society by, by creating the certainty of the legislative provisions until they're changed by parliament, while at the same time, ensuring that our citizens have the benefit of the fundamental rights that are guaranteed by the constitution. So um, for, to my way of thinking, and I, I'm sorry that I may, must say that, but, uh, but, but it's still, it's, it's one speaks the truth, that, um, that there is no debate in my mind as to how to apply the provision. That is what the law, an existing law must be read to bring it into conformity to the constitution. So that is, so the law that you, when you're deciding whether the law should be saved or not, the law is what is modified to bring it into conformity with the constitution. And I, I think that that is the, the, the approach I, I advocate. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I, I understand Sir, Sir Dennis's position, and it's a powerful argument. I would say that even the Constitution recognizes that there are exceptions, mm -hmm. and um, modified, saved, you can prescribe a general standard, and you can provide for exceptions to those in appropriate cases, and it will be whether it is an appropriate exception and for the circumstances. So, so cruel and inhumane treatment, that's a general aspiration. An acceptance that the death penalty may be cruel and inhumane, but is an appropriate exception where it is a proportionate penalty, is something I can live with. Perhaps it is a problem, so I don't know. Um, well, well, just to say, living with it is quite a fun because no one will live if the death penalty is applied to them. <laughs> <laughs> There's no room for reversal after that. We go into the next life depending on what we believe. <laughs> well, I think I think we've come to the end of our questions. Can I thank um, the audience for for its uh, questions and for listening? Can I thank the speakers also for? Uh, a stimulating debate, which I think covers issues of principle, which are perhaps not resolvable, despite the assiduous attempts by our speakers to, to, to achieve some consensus. Um, so um, with that, I think we've possibly come to an end. Um, so can I say thank you? And um, well, it's good evening in the UK and it's good morning, I think, for those of you in the Caribbean. And for those of you further east, it's probably well into the night. But thank you all for attending and for your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, good evening, good night to all.